Well, I want to welcome everyone that is here. I specifically want to welcome those that are watching from our Palouse campus, our Everett campus, our Muckleteo campus, our online campus. As I like to say, every opportunity that I have to share to all of our campuses, it is a privilege. Uh, I can't always be there physically with you, but it is uh, awesome to just be able to unite our church together around one message, specifically as we continue in this series called Divine Direction. I need to be real and say I'm really excited about this series. I'm excited about you going through this book with your growth group. I'm excited for you to read this book. Uh, alongside your Bible. I think it's really going to challenge you, inspire you, and encourage you to really uh, pursue Christ and grow in your faith. Uh, if I could ask everybody to bow your heads across all of our campuses, close your eyes. I want to invite everyone to repeat this prayer after me. Everybody say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life, in Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. One of the most frequently asked questions that I get as a pastor, in fact, when I think of my 12 years as a youth pastor or my 13 years leading Canyon Creek, this is the most often asked question, and it goes something like this. What is God's will for my life? Pastor Brandon, how do I determine what God's will is for my life? Now, you would be surprised because I not only hear this from teenagers and young adults, but I hear this from people in our church in their 50s and 60s. Because it doesn't matter where you are in life, uh, we want our life to count. We want our life to matter. And so what we are going to focus on today is I want to focus specifically on the what and the do of that question. The what and the do. As we continue to read this book and as we continue throughout this month hearing these different messages, the theme of that book, Divine Direction by Craig Gershell, is that there are seven thoughts that have the power to change your life. Seven thoughts that can change your life. And the big idea from his book is that the decisions that we make today determine the stories that we are going to tell tomorrow. So the question is, who are you today? Odds are, who you are today was determined by decisions that you made in the past. And when somebody asks you, what do you want the story of your life to be in the future? What do you want people to say about you in a month, in a year, in 10 years? What do you want people to say about you? You are deciding now what your future is going to be like. Your future is the result of the decisions that you make today. Now, here is the problem. We are terrible decision makers. I know because I work with people. Like, I have a people job. I am fascinated by the terrible decisions that people make on a regular basis. Like, they will come in, and I don't usually get people where, when they're in the process of making the decision. I get people after they're dealing with the consequences of their decision, and I, I will look at them sometimes, and I will say, now, why did you buy that? Now, why did you say that to that person? Like, why did you start dating that person? Why did you take that job in that city? I, I, I experience this all the time. Let me ask you, uh, you don't need to raise your hand because I don't want you to indict yourself. But how many of you have ever made a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion? We often make decisions that we regret. I tell my kids all the time, it's probably like my most profound parenting moments are when I teach my kids over and over again about the word regret. 
Like I have told them repeatedly that the worst word in the English language is regret. You know, oftentimes I will hear people say, I regret someone I dated. I regret a purchase I made. If you were here a month ago when I talked about my experience in August, I regret ever wanting to go see the Lunar Crater Monument. <laughs> you know, regret. And I sit down with my, my boys and I tell them all the time that you're only in high school for four years. Don't make a decision for four of, frankly, when it's all said and done, four of the most insignificant years of your life, don't make a decision that you are going to regret for the rest of it. And I tell my daughter all the time in college, like every time I see her on the weekend, I remind her, don't do things you're going to regret because you don't want to look back and say, coulda, woulda, shoulda. And regret is the worst word in the English language. I also am well aware that across all of our campuses, right here, right now, you are in the middle of praying through some significant decisions. There's some of you, you're graduating from high school and you are praying through, what am I going to do next? What's next for me? I mean, do I go to a community college? Do I go to this university? Do I do something like Sommel? Or uh, do I take a gap year and go travel around Europe? What do I do right now? There's some of you that are college graduates this year, and you're wondering, do I go ahead and jump into my career, or should I pursue grad school right now? You're wrestling through these decisions. There's probably some you are prayerfully considering a job change. You were offered a job, but the problem with this job change is that it's going to uproot your family from all of their friends, your kids from their school, and you got to move to another area, maybe even another state. You're praying through this decision. Maybe you're here and you're in a dating relationship, and you're praying through if you should take the next step in this relationship. When you think about him, you think there's many things you like about him, but there's a few concerns that you have. And you're wondering if those concerns are a big enough deal where you should, I like to say, fish or cut bait, or if you should say, let's take the next step in the relationship. Maybe some of you are parents and you're perfectly considering, should we have more kids? Or is it time to, you know, go to the doctor and have a snip snip, whatever it is. Uh, but you are praying about these important decisions that you want to make and you're here right now saying, Pastor Brandon, I need divine direction. Yeah. There has been an insane amount written over the last 10 years about generational differences. And one of the traits about the emerging generation, the, the millennials, is that they have trouble making decisions. Now, when I, when I read all these studies about millennials, it, hit home, it hits home for a number of reasons. Number one, because I have a millennial that lives in my house, and I'm spending lots of money on her going to college right now. And then in addition to that, I have a church full of millennials. And they say that this generation has a harder time committing and making decisions compared to any previous generation. And the theory is... Uh, the reason being that this generation has way more options than any previous generation. I mean, I think of it this way. When I graduated from high school, I had two options. College or work. Okay? You worked if you had some skill. If you had no skill like me, you went to college. Hopefully if you could afford it. But now they graduate from high school and they have these unlimited options. I mean, the first they got to decide, am I going to go to college or not? And then once they make that decision, they think, well, do I want to do school as a resident? Do I want to go out of state? Do I want to do school online? Or do I want to take a year off from school? Because I did running start for a couple years and I graduated with my AA and I'm only 17. Should I, you know, take a year where I just travel Europe and just have fun? Or should I go on a YWAM DTS for a year? 
year? What should I do? Maybe I should go out and start a business and see if I can just hit it big from the beginning. You know, I've actually talked to people that are graduating from high school in our youth ministry this year, and their goal is to start a YouTube channel and be famous. And I've talked to other people, they're like, I'm gonna get rich writing a blog. And they have all of these unlimited options. But basically, many millennials are having trouble making decisions because their options are unlimited. Now, um, I just got notification in the mail today, and I'm a very proud of my daughter, who is a senior at University of Washington. And after her junior year, um, she was given an academic award after her junior year because she did so well last year. So we are incredibly proud. So here's my daughter who excels academically. And since she's been in college, she's made five changes to her major. Five you think, well, good for her. I'm pr- glad she prayed through it and, you know, pursued her dreams. I am paying for her to go to college. I'm quick to tell her I'm paying for four years of school. If this takes you seven years, I'm done after four. <laughs> but they just have a really difficult time making decisions. When I went to college, I went to Northwest University for my bachelor's degree. There were three options for majors. My daughter at University of Washington, there's over 200 majors. That's why she changed so many times, because there's unlimited options. For me, I could be a pastor, I could be a teacher, or I could have been a counselor. Well, I don't have patience. (laughs) I, I, I have a hard time with little kids, so I left me one option. You want to remember that not too long ago, uh, life was just not that complicated because you had limited choices. And I I like to think when I used to fly several years ago, do you remember when the biggest question on your flight was whether or not they were going to show a movie? Do you remember when that was it? And if by luck you were on one of those flights that showed a movie, there would be a screen like two hours into the movie that would pop down. And if you were even luckier, you sat near that screen. If not, it was like so far away, you're squinting, watching the really low standard definition movie. And frankly, it didn't matter what the movie was. I mean, and usually if it was on a plane, it was the worst movie imaginable. It was some like sappy, boring love story. And you're stuck watching it because it was the only thing to watch. This past weekend, I did a wedding in another state, and as I'm flying on Alaska Airlines, I thought, I'm going to watch a movie, and there were 50 different movie options. I spent 45 minutes trying to decide what movie I was going to watch, and then when I I couldn't decide, so I just stared at the chair in front of me. Um, they, They refer to millennials, another affectionate nickname for them is they're the Netflix generation that there's so many things to watch on Netflix. There's so many good options. My wife and I, we have a, like a workout area in our garage. And uh, this morning, I got up and I wanted to work out. So I went into the garage. The problem was I was done watching my TV show. Have you ever had this one happen? And so I think, all right, I got to pick a new TV show to start watching. And so I flicked on Netflix and started thinking, do I want to watch that? No. I spent an hour trying to decide what I wanted to watch because there were so many options. After an hour, I finally gave up and went to work instead. (laughs) They call it, they call them the Netflix generation because they have so many good choices and they're afraid to make the wrong choice. I was talking to a group of our Psalmal students the other day, and they were talking about the challenge for them is they want to make the perfect decision. And because they want to make the perfect decision, they end up making no decision. Did you know sometimes the wrong decision is better than no decision? That's why we need divine direction. So today I want to share with you two thoughts 
that I believe will lay the foundation for the rest of this month and are going to lay the foundation as you read this book, as you prayerfully consider all of these messages, as you think about where you are right now, I believe that these two thoughts will lay the foundation. And my first thought is this. When it comes to God's will, God's will is more who before do. You see, when it comes to the will of God, God cares more about who you are than what you're going to do. Have you noticed that that's what we're always praying? We're saying, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do in the future? What do you want me to do with my life? What am I supposed to do next? I've been in this career. What do I do now? And we ask over and over again, what do we do? But God is much more concerned with the who than he is the do. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Paul said this. He said, it is God's will. Are you ready? Okay, you're asking, what is God's will? Here it is. Here's the zinger. Here is the answer to all of your prayer questions. What is God's will for me? Paul tells you right here in the Bible. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Thanks, Brandon. That was helpful. <laughs> Other translations say it is God's will that you be holy. So is it God's will that you be a teacher, that you be an accountant, that you be an engineer, that you be a pastor, a missionary? No. You know what his will is? That you be holy. He cares more about the who than the what you do. That word holy in the Greek is pronounced hagios. And it means to be set apart, to be different. And as a follower of Jesus, and it is amazing living in Washington. Because our culture is shifting more and more ideologically away from us. It is shifting much more philosophically and value-wise away from this. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, you were never meant to fit in. Like, you and I aren't supposed to look like everyone else. We're not supposed to act like everyone else. We're not supposed to have the values of everyone else, the ideology of everyone else. We are set apart. We are to be different because our goal in life, what we aspire to do, what we want to become is we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. When uh, Craig Gershell named this book, he actually explains why he called it divine direction versus divine destination. And he said, because our goal is to conform to the image of Christ, and it is something we have to spend our entire life doing, that we actually never really ever get there. You haven't arrived. You are still, it doesn't matter if you're here and you're 70, 80, you're 100. It doesn't matter. You haven't arrived. You're still heading in your divine direction. What is fascinating if you really study the Gospels, Jesus never talks about someone's career. He doesn't say, Peter, you're called to do this. John, you're called to do that. He talks about the who more than the do. He doesn't talk about the career. He talks about your character, talks about your calling. Did you know the only time he ever talked about someone's job in the Gospels is when he told them to lay it down to follow him? As a young minister, um, I had been a youth pastor for two years, and you got to remember that my, my life, my kind of my discipleship and my first years in ministry, it was kind of all interwoven. Like it was all kind of a part of me. I always joked that um, 
I had got saved when I was in high school and I went to Bible college and I found out in Bible survey, like if, if you grew up in church, Bible survey at a Bible college is the easiest class. It's basically all of the Bible stories you learned as a kid. Well, because I didn't grow up learning these stories as a kid, I found out who Abraham was in Bible college. When I heard the story of David and Goliath in Bible survey, I'm like looking at people saying, have you heard this story? This is amazing. (laughs) They got this from Rocky Balboa. I I mean, that's just where I was thinking. I had never heard these stories before. I'm quick to tell people that I had been a minister for five years before I found out John the Baptist and John the Beloved were two different people. I, I was sitting down reading the Bible one day, and I asked my wife, how did he write all this? But he got beheaded. And she's like, they're two different people, Brandon. I went, oh, that makes perfect sense. So um, I, I, as a young minister, I was growing in my faith, and I was learning all of these things, kind of getting a crash course in Christianity and everything. And um, my biggest problem was that my self-worth was tied in the success or failure of my youth ministry. And that was because I thought I was supposed to be a pastor. I thought that was what God's will was for me. I didn't yet understand that God's will for me was that I be sanctified and holy. And I always tell the story that there was one Wednesday night it, we'd had a really bad service. Things hadn't gone well. I don't really remember the details of the service. I just remember my response to the bad service. Di had fallen asleep, and I was just laying there. I'm an, I'm an insomniac to begin with, but I just was rehearsing how terrible the youth service was over and over again in my mind. And by the time the devil was done messing with me, I had felt like a total failure. And so I got up out of bed and I started pacing in my condo and I start praying and I'm having this wine session with God. I don't know if you've ever done that before. I mean, I'm saying things like, Jesus, you called me to be a youth pastor, but you gave me these kids and this church and I don't know what I'm doing and nobody comes and, you know, I'm complaining back and forth. And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, Brandon, I want you to go look up 1 Thessalonians 516. So here it was. 1 Thessalonians 516. So remember, I'm struggling. I am really newly saved, new as a minister, and this was the encouraging word I got from Jesus. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And I read that and I thought, that does not help. <laughs> and then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Brandon, I want you never read the next part. And so I read on and it said, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I paused, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So God's will for me wasn't to be a pastor. I mean, God's will for me was to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, I began to pray through that and think through that. And basically what I started saying was, so really what matters to you, Jesus, is me and you. Like my relationship with you is ultimately what matters. Do you realize that you can become the richest person in our church, but if you die without knowing Jesus, you lost. You can be the best teacher. I mean, you can take a subject and communicate it to a student in the way where the light bulb comes on and win teacher of the year awards and, you know, be just a great example. But if you don't know Jesus, you miss the purpose of this life. Because in the end, what he cares about is me and him. He cares much more about the who than the do. People always ask, God, what do you want me to do? It's always about the what and the do. The better question is, God, who do you want me to become? What do you want me to become? Becoming the right who will lead you to the right do. 
See, the question I, I, I would ask you, probably before I shared this, because I've already, you know, hopefully you wouldn't answer it wrong, or you really haven't been listening. But if I was to ask you this, and I was to say, how many of you think it's God's will that Pastor Brandon be a pastor? No? Okay, good. You were listening. No, that is not the, God's primary will for my life. That is his secondary will. Yeah. His primary will is that I be holy. His primary will is that I know him. His primary will has more about my character than my profession. You see, the pastor is what I do, but it's not who I am. Yep, who matters more to yep. God than the do. Um, an engineer is what you do. It's not who you are. A student is what you do. It's not who you are. Well, Brandon, how does this help me? I'm trying to figure out if I should take this job or not. Pastor Brandon, how does this help me? I'm trying to decide if we should adopt this child or not. How does this help me? Well, it starts with your character. So rather than ask, should I do this? You should say things like, am I the person that I need to be? Um, people will always come to me and they'll meet with me, um, usually when they're single and, uh, of course, when they're single. And they will say, Pastor Brown, I just, I just don't want to spend the rest of my life single. Am I going to get married? And I, I just really want to marry this type of person. And they will describe like this perfect person. And I always come back to them and I say, rather than worry about who, the type of person you're going to marry, you need to become the type of person that you can look yourself in the mirror and be proud of who you were becoming in the sight of God first. So you become that person that when somebody eventually meets you, they would want to marry you. Well, Pastor Brandon, should I take this job? You need to be a faithful follower of Jesus first. Pastor Brandon, what should I major in? Well, whatever it is, make sure that you are serving Jesus faithfully in it. Before you think about the do in the future... Think about the who in the present. Instead of always asking Jesus, what do you want me to do in the future? We should be asking Jesus, who do you want me to be right now? Start with the who. So God's will is more who than do. Are you with me? Are you hearing me? All right. Some of you are like stoically looking at me. Um, the second thing, the second thought that I have for you, it's God's will is much more why before what. The why before what. My point is that not only does the who matter, the motives matter yeah. to God. Proverbs 16.2 says this. It says, all a person's way seem pure to them. Have you ever noticed that? That we are really quick and easy on ourselves. Like, we are quick to convince ourselves that everything we do is right. There was a, a, a gal that was one of my youth leaders back in my youth ministry days, and she met with me a couple of years ago, and um, we had to remove her from youth staff, and I don't want to go into any of the details other than she met with me because she was still, years later, carrying this bitterness towards me removing her from being a youth leader. And so I paused, and I said, how old is your child? And she said, my you know, she's 13, and, and I said, so as a parent of a teenager, how would you feel if someone that was overseeing your teenager did this? She said, I would be furious. And I said, well, I mean, you're basically saying you wouldn't allow someone that was doing what you did in your child's life. And she said, but it was different for me. <laughs> that, that's it, like, a person's way seem pure to them. Like we are so easy on ourselves. It's so quick to convince ourselves that everything that we do is right. But then it says, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Yeah. See, God judges our motives. 
There's an old saying that says there are usually two reasons why everyone does something. There is the reason that we tell everyone, and then there's the real reason. So in other words, there's the reason that we say why we did it, and then there's actually the truth. Motors, motives matter to God. I always uh, begin every prayer time with Psalms 139, verse 23. And this is a next step for you. And I want you to memorize this verse. And so I have almost this liturgy that I pray through every morning when I pray. And it says this, Psalms 139, 23, 24. It says, search my heart, O God. Test and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wickedness in me. And if there is, lead me in the way of everlasting. So every time I pray, I ask God to not only test my motives, but to test my thoughts. And that is because more often than not, I find myself doing things from impure motives. I find myself at times, I, this might not be you, but it's me, I find myself way too often me-centered, not Christ-centered. And so I say, Lord, uh, search my heart, O God, test and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wickedness in me. And if there is, lead me in the way of everlasting to give myself an opportunity to be right with Jesus and to check myself. Because I know, left to myself, my motives are going to sway towards me-centered, not Christ-centered. Did you know that it's, it's very difficult to get to the right place when you have the wrong motives? Come on. That's right. It's hard to get to the right destination when you start with the wrong why. The why matters to God. Examine <laughs> your motives. The why before what. The who before do. Colossians 3.17, Paul said this. He said, and whatever you do. So what does whatever mean? It means everything. So when he says, and whatever you do, meaning whatever you do, what you mean like when I work, whatever. When I go to school, whatever. Like when I go to a sporting event, whatever. When I'm stuck in traffic, whatever you do. So whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, wherever you are, wherever you work, wherever you live, do it for the Lord. Too often we think, um, once I get here, then I'll do the Jesus thing. You know, once I finish college, then I'll start serving Jesus. Once I get the right job, then I'll start doing this. Um, you need to serve Jesus faithfully where you are. If you're here and you're believing someday, you know, I'm going to work in Chi Alpha. Well, while you're a student, you should see yourself as a Chi Alpha missionary right now. You might think, well, uh, someday, and I tell my boys this all the time, they say, Dad, I, I think I want to be a pastor. And I look at them and I say, well, then you should be reaching your school right now. You would say, well, uh, someday I want to own a really successful business. Well, while you're right now working at Taco Bell, you should be doing whatever in the name of the Lord. You better be making the best stinking chalupas that have ever been made. Like, whatever you do, do it for the Lord. If you're going to be, a, you say, I want to be a doctor, but right now I'm at home taking care of my kids. Right now I'm at home changing a baby's diaper. I mean, that baby better have the cleanest butt of any baby that has ever existed. Because whatever you do, you are doing to the best of your ability to honor Jesus Instead of always saying, Jesus, what's that big thing out there? Yeah. 
Serve Jesus right here, right now, right where you are. Be faithful right where you are. Oftentimes, whenever we see anyone successful, what we think is, well, they made a few of those critical decisions right. That is wrong. I mean, it is a lot more than they made a few critical decisions a lot. Whenever you see anybody successful, they had to make hundreds of daily decisions to deny themselves so that someday they'd be where they are. Who before do, the why before what? Um, I, I kind of close with this thought. I don't really enjoy doing funerals. I love doing weddings. I love doing dedications and baptisms, but funerals are always challenging. But the one consistent thing about a funeral is that everyone is usually really sad. And I don't like do well in situations where people are sad. I always joke, in fact, all of the gals on my staff know that if I really want to get what I want, I cry because crying is Brandon's kryptonite. <laughs> and uh, the thing about funerals I think that can be confusing for me is the two important dates like you see on a tombstone are the dates that someone's born and then they're the date they die. We talk a lot about the day they're born and then the day they die, but in between those two dates is a little tiny dash. Like that dash is almost like totally insignificant, like it doesn't matter. Did you know that the day you're born and the day you die, those are probably the least two insignificant. They're probably the least significant days in your life. But what really matters is the dash, the how you live your life and who you are. And the why you are who you are. That's what matters most. That dash. Um, I, I just turned 46 last year. I turned 47 in January. And in June, so when I, when I think of being 47, I think I probably got, I probably lived half my life. You know, I like to tell everybody I'm going to live to be 100, 120 with technology, who knows, but... <laughs> Probably, it's more practical, I've, I've lived over half of my life. Di and I have been married for 25 years. And so when I think about living over half my life, I want the last half of my life to really matter. And I want it to be about the who I am and the why I do what I do more than anything. Because when Di and I are 80 and we are long retired ministers... And, you know, we're holding hands, sitting on the couch, and we're looking back at our life. I don't want to talk about all the stuff we did. I don't want to talk about the church. I don't want to talk about uh, buildings that we built, campuses that we started. I want to talk about who we, who we are and the investment that we made in helping people become who God has called them to be. So I close just with this. What do you want the story of your life to be? When you think of the dash, what do you want that story for your life to be?